It is in our sermon outline, but might as well <coughs> find it in your Bible, make sure there's no typos from Microsoft or something. <coughs> Matthew seven twenty one to the end of the chapter. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Thank you very much. Well, we have been going through the book of Matthew. We have also just, uh, this is our last message on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and uh, so this brings us to the, uh, as in this closing, this brings us to a point where Jesus is bringing things to a conclusion. He's putting things and tying all these things up together. And as we see this passage that we're looking at today, we can't help but wonder and look at this and look at the state of our country, and we can see that the state of shambles that it is in. And it's easy to point the blame outward for the problems that we have and that we see in our world and in our country that we live in right now. We can blame we can blame political parties, we can blame leftists, we can blame the woke crowd, but ultimately when it comes right down to it, and this is my opinion, but I think that there's good evidence to back it up, I would have to put the blame on pastors. I'd have to put the blame on preachers. And, and yes, I know it's my profession and I have to be careful saying this, but I think that the onus of the problems that we see in our country and in our world is due to the sin of omission by those who are in spiritual leadership in the Christian church. And I'm not just talking about the past five, six years. I, I've been looking at this and seeing that this is almost a hundred year problem, if not longer, at a minimum. I, I've seen pastors move from preaching the gospel to preaching good works um, to taking Christ out of the out of the pulpit and replacing it with with ethics and with feel good theology, replacing faith with good works, also just also seen as Christless Christianity. But I think in many ways we can see that the die has been set in our country and in our world, and that the path back to righteousness is a grim path. It is no longer backtracking that will bring us back to a, a better country, to a better world, but instead it is going through it. And in so many times we have seen this throughout biblical history, the history of Israel. And rarely do you ever see God's people making a reversal and, and returning to faith in God and God alone. They have to go into exile. They have to go through a destruction of them, their own country before they come back. But there is one instance when we do see this, though, in, in the life of King Josiah, where the scrolls of the law were found, and you can find the story in 2 Kings chapter 22. Josiah led his nation in humble repentance when he heard the book of the law that was discovered and being read. And it goes like this. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Achiham, the son of Shaphan, 
a Achbor, the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, the, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and the people in all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that it's written concerning us. And if you want to read the full story in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23, you will see that Josiah pretty much, after hearing these things, he pretty much went around in the mountains and the hills and cleaned house. He destroyed everything that represented, that was represented at anything that was vile and anything that was not of God. But even though at the end of the story, at the end of chapter 23, it was not enough for God to turn from his wrath because of the sins of Manasseh. But yet Josiah provides for us a, a very interesting lesson, for he heard the word of God and he acted upon it. He responded with humility of heart, tearing his clothes in repentance and doing away with the false gods that were in the land and restored worship to God the Most High. And I believe that the world we live in right now, though, closer resembles the passage that we read in our call to worship from Isaiah chapter 6, which goes as follows. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah was saying over here, Here am I, send me, I'll be the missionary. I'll save souls. But what was the message that God gave to Isaiah? Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not proceed. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Now, Isaiah didn't go, well, that's a bummer of a message. What did he say? He said, how long? How long am I supposed to be preaching this message? And, and God answered, he says, until the cities are devastated and without inhabitant. Houses are without people and the land is utterly desolate. That's not a pretty good picture. But I think that is what closely resembles our country versus a, a repentant Josiah. And... and I believe this illustrates our contemporary world. And when I mean contemporary, I mean as in the past 40, 50, 60 years. But not only be, we have lived in a land of plenty, but we have lived in a land where we are rich and fat with gospel preaching. But in some ways, that would be almost extremely hard to believe when you look out at our, at our world because it feels like we are living in a spiritually starved country in a world. We're living in, in a world that is just spiritually starved. And the world is gorging itself not on the gospel, but on the wanton lusts that lead to judgment. And we only have to look at the horrifying, God-defying acts on display at the beginning of this year's Olympics to see this as evidence. And I won't even speak of the things that were done because they're just simply too disgusting and vile. So let me just say again that I truly believe that this condition we are in, I, I partially lay at my own feet because everyone that is a minister of the word of God in our world today also takes that as well. And may God have mercy on us as, as preachers of his word. But I believe it is a result of two things. Preaching that does not preach the cross of Christ and the need of repentance of our sins. And just a feel good, gooey, good works with no power to back it up. And secondly, if Christ was preached and his cross and his resurrection power and, and the need of repentance, and it's because people have shut their ears like Isaiah 6 to the truth of God's word. The first set of verse of today's message really do point, though, to religious leaders, to the prophets, to the preachers of the word of God. Because when it says when that, in that passage where it says, did we not prophesy in your name? The word there can actually be used as preach. That is a commonly interchanged word that is in this passage. And I pray that I never fall into that category. But 
even the words of Jesus still are being preached in this world to this day and to these and to this people here. And God's word does not return void when his gospel is being preached and the people are being called to repentance. And the last five verses of our message drives home the need that we really have in our world today. Faith. That's the need. Real, genuine faith. Not just a, an intellectual and verbal assent to the knowledge of God and who he is, but a living, acting, and breathing faith that says, I need God. I put my faith and trust in him. Now, I want to repeat that because I think that's important for us. It's not just intellectual and verbal assent to the knowledge of God. That's not just the faith that we're talking about today. But it's a living, acting, and breathing faith that says, I need God. I need him to hear God, to listen to him, and to put into action what he has given us today to live by and to enjoy life by. So let's begin by looking at the first three verses of our passage today, 21 through 23 of Matthew 7. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So the first thing that Jesus is addressing is lip service. You've often heard the phrase, how do you know when a politician is lying? His lips are moving. You know, we hear noises coming out of their mouth, but we do not see action coming out from them. Broken promises, essentially. And so Jesus is saying, first of all, about these prophets or, or teachers or preachers, he is saying they're calling him Lord, but they're not treating him like he is Lord. They're not the doing the will of his father. And so what is the will of the father? And one could easily see that everything that we've been going through the past few months in the Sermon on the Mount is the will of the Father. And I love, and it can be distilled down into a, a simple phrase, and I like how the Westminster Confession of Faith begins, and I think it helps us to understand the will of God in a very easy, simplified way. Question that begins, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Shorter Catechism says, what is the chief end of man? The answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You see, to enjoy though God, we must first desire to know God. I, I want to repeat that again. That's another statement I really like. To enjoy God, we must first desire to know God to love God, to love his commandments, and, and say, just like David did in, in Psalm 119, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the age because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained, restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. David had a sincere love and desire to know God and his laws and his ways. David walked in humility also. And that is a characteristic that we find absent in the people in our passage today in verses 27 and 26 and 27 that we're looking at today of the many who will say to Jesus on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, cast out demons, and in your name, perform many miracles. These are not humble people. These are the ones who are going to say, hey, Lord, I'm good. Look at all the good I've done. I have preached in your name. I've cast out demons in your name. I've performed many miracles. I'm good to go. I've checked off all the right boxes as a preacher. I've played the part. See, I'm a good boy or girl. 
And that's exactly the problem. They think they're good and there's nothing wrong with them. And they're just and that's just what they've been doing. They've been playing Christianity. And if you're playing Christianity, eventually you're going to get bored with that game. If you are truly enjoying God, you will never get bored of enjoying God. So the life begun by faith and in humility to our Lord is a life that continues to seek to glorify God, to know his will, and to do his will. So the preacher who beats his chest and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and lives a life of humble repentance is the preacher that will be miles and miles ahead of the one that casts out a lot of demons and thinks that he is doing a favor to God and that he is good and indispensable. All his goodness really, we know this from scripture, is like dirty, stinking, filthy rags that he's waving proudly before God. His preaching, his casting out demons, his performing miracles are all dirty, still, stinking, filthy rags in the sight of God. And they have never known God, and God has never known them. And then God's, Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I'd like to turn our attention now to the last five verses, which we'll be looking at in three different sections. First, we'll look at verses 24 and 5, and then we'll look at verses 26 and 20, 27, and then finally, verse 28. But all of these really have everything to do with everyone who hears the word of God and acts or does not act. <clears throat> the recipients of Jesus preaching, the disciples and the crowd, and, and those who in the future, like us, hear the word of God being preached, Jesus begins these words with a simple word, therefore. And it forces us to look at everything previously that we have been going through on the Sermon on the Mount, starting from chapter 5, verse 1. And so Jesus basically states that if you've heard what he is saying and you act upon it, you're going to be like a wise man. Because hearing and acting makes faith. But one of the things we have to recognize in this passage is that Jesus himself is the Lord God Almighty. And we see this throughout this passage that we're looking at today. Notice in verse 21, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. And again in verse 27, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In verse 23, he says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Jesus is speaking of his being the judge on judgment day. And so rightfully in verse 24, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, we can see that Jesus is declaring himself to be that great and awesome, terrible judge on that final day. He is declaring himself to be God Almighty, our final judge. But he gives us encouragement in verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. You see, faith makes us wise in the midst of trials and tribulation. And we can become stronger when we are insulted, when we are shamed by trust by others, if we trust in God and not in ourselves. And, and again, as I've said before in other messages, James is really a commentary. If we read it closely enough, we'll see that it is really a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And it's perfectly encapsulated in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 7 of James' famous message that faith without works is dead. That is real faith. It is a working faith, a faith that is living, breathing, and building a house, an act of faith. It is 
going to be seen as someone who hears God's word and acts upon it. And so Jesus now uses an illustration of two different people uh, building two different homes. And, and one of these people has their faith firmly united and mixed with the word that has been preached to them. And I love how the book of Hebrews speaks very much to this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, because it describes those people in verse 26 and 27 of our passage, when in Hebrews he says, For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. And now let's hear this very same thing, though, in, from Jesus' lips in parable form. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. The word that was preached to this moron that was heard was not united by faith because that word foolish man is actually the word that we have in, in, in Greek is closest to that word morana. It was not mixed with faith, as some translations say. So when the trials of tribulations come, back to this concept being mixed with faith, I like to say that faith is the cement of our spiritual life. So when the trials and the tribulation of this life come and, and there is no faith and those who are playing Christianity not only get bored, but they get scared. They fear man more than they fear God. And this is very evident in our current world that we live in with COVID, with lockdowns and with so many other things. And, and this is a test and it is a trial of our faith. And we're shamed in, in many ways for not following the little rules and and, and personally though I, i'm grateful for those times that we are in right now and what we have gone through because standing up for jesus now is not the same as standing up for jesus five to six years ago for most people in fact i would probably say we are gone we have gone through and we are going through a sorting and a sifting a separation of the sheep and goats in some sense but unfortunately, in so many different ways, those who hear and do not act are still on the path to destruction. Verse 26 tells us that this foolish man, and again, that word in Greek is where we really get our word moron from, which is completely appropriate for people who have heard over and over and over again the truth of the gospel and don't do anything about it. <clears throat> They are, in fact, spiritual morons. In fact, I would dare to say there is a greater condemnation for those who have heard and done nothing. There's a greater knowledge in them of what's taking place spiritually in this world, and yet they do nothing except play the Christian game. And it will lead to their destruction. I like to call these also sunny day Christians. As, as long as the sun is shining, they, they will sing, Jesus loves me. But as soon as the trials and the tribulations of this life hit, they disappear faster than they came on the scene. But in the same storms of life, standing firm against trials and tribulation doesn't necessarily mean that we all look like stalwart warriors with, with long beards and armor and standing face first into a gale storm. Our faith is weak. Our faith is smaller than that of a mustard seed. In Mark chapter 9, verse 24, a man came to Jesus begging that his son be healed. And the man asked, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cries out, I do believe, help my unbelief. There's a desperation in his words. And I feel so often, so many times that I'm like this man crying out, I do believe, help my unbelief. 
And I love the words of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Jesus is the solid foundation for everything that we do, believe, act, or think. And, and what do we build on that foundation, though? Do we build wood or hay or stubble? Or do we continue using that solid rock, that precious stone of Jesus, to continue building the walls on our firm foundation? Because if I know Jesus, and, and I know myself, I would rather be using his material and not mine. And I think that there are some of us who can humbly yet confidently say, Jesus knows me. Because as Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount, he started out with, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. So to know Jesus isn't simply like, a, I'm, I, he's my buddy upstairs. To know Jesus is to know him as our judge and as our savior and as our friend. He intimated his judgeship throughout this whole sermon. And he put an exclamation mark on it in this passage that we're speaking on today. He is that judge that we will stand before on that final day. And if we are his and he knows us, he will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy which has been prepared for you. And I'm so glad that I have Jesus as my rock. And it would be easy to end the message here, but what happens next is very, very interesting. It's very, very wonderful because what Matthew says is when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching <clears throat> for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. I don't think of this as the kind of amazement where people stand up and clap and cheer and, and applaud a wonderful speech. This message had driving conviction. There was a passion and a, and a depth in his language that pierced their hearts. The religious leaders of Jesus' time, they were pretty much what we would call today's sages on the stage. Have you ever heard that phrase? The old sage on the stage, where you have some old stage standing up on a stage and just previously quoting the sages from beforehand, from years gone by, and just repeating the same old thing. And now you hear in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would often phrase, say, he used the phrase, you have heard it said. And this is in reference to the quoting of those sages of that day. Because this is what they would have been saying as well. But Jesus, the living word, was speaking that day to the disciples, to the crowd. And he's speaking that to us today. So the question that I have for us today is, what are you going to do with the words you have heard from God's word, the living word, Jesus Christ? Will it be an act of faith, stepping out and believing that God is in control of your destiny and fate, and that he loves you and that he cares for you? Sometimes we don't obey God after we have heard the word that has been spoken to us because of the fear of man. Sometimes there are things in our life that can get us down, that can make us feel ashamed. I know because I've been there. It makes us almost want to go hide in the produce section when we see certain people in the store and we pray and hope that they have left before we wander out of the produce section because we're afraid to see them and it opens up old wounds all over again. And we forget that we have a God that has taken care of all of that. All of our shame. He hung naked on a cross in front of a huge crowd of people as a criminal. The Apostle Paul was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because Jesus Christ was his solid rock foundation and he believed it and he lived it. And he took a few rocks to the head because of that. But he is never ashamed of it. When we act in faith, it's not always a sure foot and a steady and ready for action. 
uh, you know, I would love to go ask the priests that were with Joshua when they when they stuck their feet on the shore of the Jordan River, if they were not shaking as Joshua went and told them and go drown themselves. And I'm sure that some of them were probably thinking that. Yet the waters parted because they believed. They acted on that. I would like to ask them as they, as they marched around the city of Jericho and sang and blew trumpets, looking ridiculous like a bunch of clowns to the Jerichoans. Stepping out in faith and trusting God doesn't mean that our feet are not shaking. We need God to help our unbelief, don't we? He will remain faithful. I've heard that the definition of courage is the ability to act when scared half to death. But we have a sure foundation. We have built our house on Jesus Christ, the solid rock. Our feet may shake, but our foundation will not. I want to repeat that. Our feet may shake but our foundation will not. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are our rock, and that our feet are firmly planted. And if they are not, I pray that we would act in faith, believing and trusting in your sure word that you have given to us today. We thank you for your word. Not only that because it saved us in the beginning, but that it's continually saving us. And that this faith isn't just a one-time thing, but it's a faith that grows and grows in our life and in our world. Lord, help us to share that faith and to be bold with your message and say, as Paul the Apostle, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. We pray all these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.